here. God, that your church um, is here and is, is paid for uh, by the blood of your son, Jesus. God, we ask that as we worship you today, that our hearts would truly be drawn to you in remembrance of what you've done. God, we ask that you would bless us as we sing to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who's come to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. can stop oh who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty oh who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord oh who can stop the Lord Almighty no one oh who the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains When every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him Amen. Amen. Would you guys please turn to someone who's next to you, tell them welcome to Mountain Bible this morning, and whatever you're comfortable with, a hug, handshake, high five, just welcome somebody.
Hey, good morning, good morning. Go ahead and find yourself a seat, please. Pop a squat somewhere. Find yourself a seat. Man, you guys are easier to bring back in than my middle school students, so that's good, yeah. Congratulations, you grew up. So, well done, well done. <laughs> uh, have, you, have you guys had a good week? Yeah, yeah? By show of hands, this is how we do it in the youth, youth group. By show of hands, who's, who has had a good week? Okay, really glad to hear that. Uh, maybe who has not had such a good week? It's kind of been meh. Okay, one or two being courageous enough to raise your hand. Appreciate that. Talk to someone before you leave. That's why we gather. Glad you're here. Uh, my week has been pretty good. Thank you for asking. Um, except for a couple of days ago, uh, I was introduced to a song for the very first time, a classic 90s song called Achy Breaky Heart by Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> And that's when my week went bad. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just, it was bad, actually. I can't stand that song. It's stuck in my head. I was singing it in the shower this morning. Um, I think I fully understand what Paul was talking about when he said a thorn in his side. You know? So anyway, all right. Well, hey, look, good morning. I'll stop wasting your time. I just want to give, get through a few announcements with you guys so you guys know what's happening here at Mountain Bible Church. First of all, my name is Daniel Newberry. I'm the youth pastor here. So if you're a first time, second time, or even a third time visitor and you'd like to know more about what's going on here at Mountain Bible Church, we've got these excellent little guest information cards in the backs of the chairs in front of you. If you would just grab one of those, fill it out, and then give it to the information desk outside on your way out this morning, we've got a free little coffee cup we want to give you and it has my face on it, and I'm kidding, you wouldn't want that. Um, we have a coffee cup we want to give you, and someone will get in contact with you and answer any questions that you may have, and just help you get connected with the church. Uh, a couple other things. First of all, uh, you guys know that Kids Club meets here on Wednesday nights, like every Wednesday night during Family Fuel. We are in desperate need of adult volunteers for like the next eight weeks, just eight weeks, just if you have eight Wednesdays where you can spare an hour and a half of your time, we would love to take that from you and use you uh, to, to serve the kids here on Wednesday nights. So starting on March 30th until summer break, we really need as many adult volunteers as we can get. So if you've got the time, if you've got the heart, and you just feel like the Lord's calling you to use your time that way, uh, we would really appreciate it. Please, please get in contact with Felicia Moore. You can, you can find her in Kidstown uh, after church. Also, we want to invite everyone to our all-church work day, which will be on Saturday, April 9th, from 9 to 12. Um, bring gloves, bring a rake, bring a shovel, bring work boots, preferably bring uh, other kids who can, like, help pick up dirt and stuff like that. Uh, look, this is more just kind of a time for fellowship. I don't expect you all to get anything done, but... <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're going to get some good work done. We're going to get some good work done. But really, we want to say, hey, you know what? Let's just come together as a church, and let's take care of our property as a family, you know? And so if you have the time on Saturday, April 9th from 9 to 12, please be here. We'll provide uh, lunch and water so you don't die of thirst out here, and it's just going to be a really good time. But that's all the announcements I have for you. Now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you perhaps the greatest 28-year-old to have ever lived, <laughs> my best friend, Mr. Hunter Barr. Thank you. I, I'm 27, by the way, so not almost 30, that, which is nice. Um, hi, I'm Hunter Barr. Some of you may know me. Others may not. Um, I am, I've been up here for the past eight months off and on, uh, filling in with my wife doing worship, but when I'm not beating on a weird shaped box that makes noise, I am the Young Life Area Director for Payson. And what that means is, uh, most of you may have heard of Young Life, others may not. Um, Young Life is a mission to high school and middle school students, and in other places to single moms, college kids, all over the world. We're in, a, we're in 147 different countries, and What's most important to me is Payson, because I grew up here. Uh, my dad was a police officer here for 20 plus years, and uh, my family's been here my whole life. Um, and so what Young Life is, is, well, let me start this off with a question. Uh, how many of you at a time in your life didn't know who God was or how good he was, right? So high school is weird because we've all been there, 
But now we have all these distractions when we're in high school. You know, Instagram, video games, TV, Kardashians, you know, all these different things. But if you could close your eyes with me for a second, think of this. You've just been told that you should seek who God is, right? And on your way, you're met with all these distractions, fart noises from your friends in the corner, pretty girls, your teachers telling you you're not smart enough, your parents telling you you're not good enough. How hard is that to find a God that is good? And so my mission and Young Life's mission, which has been an amazing opportunity for Payson, for the youth to meet Jesus where they're at, for Jesus to come to their school, hang out with them in a room, um, for them to have pizza. You know, that's the young life thing. Oh, man, I'm hurting, and I got all these problems. It's pizza time. Let's talk about that. No, young life, young life has actually been ministered to by our church, and I'm happy to say that it's, it's my church. Mountain Bible has become my church. And what I wanted to let you guys know is over the past year, we have taken 50 kids to camp, some, some odd like that. For the past four years, we've taken 170 kids to camp. Even through COVID, we met and we hung out with kids who weren't able to go to school, who weren't able to meet in groups larger than five to 10 people for a majority of 2020. And we met outside with kids when it was freezing cold. Brooklyn remembers, right? Eating Taco Bell, which isn't great, but it's not bad. <laughs> Young Life is a ministry to Payson, and Mountain Bible has supported us for the past couple of years. And I wanted to encourage you guys that if you don't know anything about it, you can use the Goog machine to Google it, or you can ask me. Um, but what I want you guys to know is there's people like me, not, not just me, not just Daniel, not just all the other youth pastors around town that are ministering to kids in our community, trying to lead them to Christ, trying to show them that there's more to life than just being good enough for the people around them. And so, ask me. If you, if you don't have my number and I'm out of here, Billy has my number, Bobby's got my number, Daniel's my best friend, I'm, I'm his best friend, I hope. So, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hunter. He, he, Hunter's been uh, a real blessing to me ever since I got here, and he's really helped me get connected with the, the youth in this town, and I'm really excited about his ministry that's got going on here. Uh, let me go ahead and pray for us, and we're going we're gonna to get back into worshiping God for everything that he's done in our lives, for everything he's doing in this church and in this community. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good, always so good to us, even when we don't deserve it, even when we don't see it, we know you are always good, and you're always taking care of us. Lord, we ask that as we now move into this time of worshiping you, we ask that you would open up our hearts to receive you, open up our minds to understand you, and, 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 and Lord, just let us use this time to engage you, to actually get to know you, to interact with you, and not just be passively singing along to a song, but actually worshiping you for who you are. Lord, as, we, as, as Pastor Billy comes up here and he opens up the word to us, Lord, uh, again, open up our hearts to receive it. Let, let your word, let your gospel pierce our hearts so that we can grow closer to you, so that we can put ourselves aside every day and just want to know you more. I'm really thankful for um, the Young Life Ministry here in town, Lord, and I just want to pray for that as well and ask that you would continue to use Hunter and his team of volunteers um, and just the whole Young Life program here, Lord, to bring kids closer to you, to show them the love of your son. And any way that Mountain Bible Church can continue to partner with that, Lord, uh, give us the ability and, and the, the mindset for that. In Christ's name that we pray, amen and amen. Hey, let's go ahead and stand up. Come let us worship. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what 
our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive. You break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every God, 
That is who you are. And you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every life. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, you turn your lives around. I worship you. I worship you. stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't see it you're working you never stop you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you work, even when I don't feel that you working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who Way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, 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 that Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are way maker, miracle work, promise keep 
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here. I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need Sin runs deep, where sin runs deep, your grace is more, but grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, your holiness is Christ in where you are, yeah, where you are, Lord, I am free, your holiness is Christ in me, oh, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, yeah. song so teach my song to rise to you yes Lord when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand or fall on you oh Lord Jesus you're my hope and stay so teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand or fall on you, oh Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning. 
Good to see you guys this morning. Hey, before we get into our study, I just want to uh, make you aware, if you haven't heard already, that um, Denny Morse, just one of our, our beloved guys who's been with us for years and years and years, went to be with the Lord yesterday morning. He'd had a, a, a nasty stroke about three months ago. He's had a, at least one or two since then, and he's been having seizures. And uh, his sweet wife, Linda, has been, has been taking care of him, and they've been back and forth from the valley, and, and he's really, um, he's just, just really been struggling. And so uh, we're, we're so sad to lose him. What a, what a pivotal part of this fellowship he's always been. Uh, but we're really glad also that the Lord spared them just the hardship of, of what he was going through for much longer and took him to be with the Lord. So be praying for Linda and the family. Uh, we'll pray for them here in just a minute. And also just wanted to, just to let you know, if you weren't here yesterday, we had um, truly just a, a wonderful celebration of life for uh, Jim and, yeah, it was amazing, for Jim and, and Michael Olson's son, Jesse, uh, who passed away last week. Um, just a great time of, of honestly just, just, just uh, remembering God's faithfulness even in the hardest times and celebrating the life that Jesse lived. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, a bittersweet, I guess, celebration of life. So uh, be praying for those two families. And, and let's do that now, if you would. Just bow your heads with me. Let's pray for them. And then we'll get into the scriptures this morning. Well, Lord, we, we are so thankful Father, that we, as Christ followers, of those who have been redeemed, Lord, the, the sting of death has been taken from us. Lord, we thank you that, that you bore that upon yourself, Jesus. And because of what you have done for us, we know that there is, there is life everlasting beyond this life. And so, God, we praise you that we know Denny is with you now, in your presence, rejoicing, and we ask for Linda that you would just comfort her heart as she's lost her lifelong companion. Lord, we just pray that you would, you would be near to her and that you would help us as a church family to come around her and to love her and, and uh, just support her. And, um, and Lord, we, we thank you that we know, we have confidence that Jesse Olson is also in your presence. God, we thank you that you have given uh, his family that assurance, and we just pray the same for Jim and Michael and their family. Comfort them, Lord. Thank you for their example of strength in the midst of this. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Speaking of the example of strength, I, I, was, I was just so blown away as I came to church last Sunday. And knowing that, that Jim and Michael had just lost their son, and walking up to the church and seeing them greeting us, seeing them out front greeting with the big smiles on their faces and just hugging people and loving people and shaking people's hands. And man, it was just such an encouragement to me. It just, it just spoke so much to the fact that Jesus is real. Amen. Amen. God is real and he's at work. And, and if you've ever watched someone like them just stand strong in the face of difficulty, Someone who knew that what they were about to go through was going to be tough or painful, and yet they just approached it in faith. Man, it's such an encouragement. And we will see in our passage this morning the ultimate example of that in Jesus. The ultimate example of someone who knew that what they were about to enter into, what they were about to face, was going to be the hardest thing imaginable, and yet faced it with strength and faced it with courage. And so we'll begin in chapter 18, picking up in our study through the, the book of John this morning, and we'll, we'll read the first, first, the first nine verses. So look at the first nine verses with me. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, 
Whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am. Notice, he is in italics. We'll talk about that in a minute. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So they had finished their Passover meal in the upper room. Jesus had prayed, and they left the upper room. They made their way down across the Kidron Valley where the, the brook Kidron flowed. It's actually more of sort of a ravine and a, a very small brook that flows there most of the time. But at this point in the Passover week, that brook would be flowing red. With the, with the blood of the sacrificed lambs that were taking place on the Temple Mount just above there. And how must that have impacted Jesus? As he is walking across that brook that's flowing red with the blood of the, of the sacrificial lambs, it, it, it may even, depending on, on the time and what was happening on the Temple Mount, at times it was, it was really something you had to, you had to wade through. You weren't even able to jump across it or walk across it. And so it's possible that they maybe even had to wade through it. Well, they made their way to the garden. We know it as Gethsemane on the lower part of the Mount of Olives where Jesus often took the disciples to pray. And knowing this, Judas met them there with a detachment of troops to arrest him. And look at verse 4 again. Knowing all things that would come upon him, likely with, with the blood of Passover lambs on his robe, on the hem of his robe, Jesus went forward. Jesus went forward. He knew that, that just as the thousands of sheep were being, were being sacrificed on the Temple Mount, that he himself was about to become the ultimate sacrificial lamb. And knowing this, he stepped forward. He didn't shrink back. He didn't, he didn't question. He stepped forward. What an incredible courage. What an amazing act of, of strength for Jesus. In his humanity, he wrestled. We know this. But he stepped forward. Why? There's no other reason other than the fact that it was for his amazing love. His great love for you and for me, for the sinners of this world. That's the only reason. That's what motivated Jesus to just step forward. And he asked the troops, whom are you seeking? And when he said, I am, notice the he is in italics. It was added afterwards for clarification. I believe, as Pastor Dave often says, that's something I would have contention with with those who are ordering the, the verses and all. I am, we know, you remember, is what, is what the Lord told Moses. When Moses, when the Lord sent Moses, and the Lord said, and he said, who, who should I tell them is sending me? On what authority am I coming? And, and the Lord said, tell them I am sent you. It's, it's, this is a, a clear declaration of Jesus' deity once again. So when Jesus says, I am, they all fell flat on their backs. Some say as many as 600 troops fell flat on their backs, including Judas. And don't you love that he asked them a second time? I love that. Who is it again you're looking for? As they're trying to gather their swords and helmets and torches and things, you know, trying to look menacing and tough and... And, and they stand back up, and here he is. He's in his robes. He doesn't have a sword on. He's not in a fighting stance. He says, who is it again? I would imagine that the second time they weren't as bold as they said, Jesus of Nazareth, bracing for impact, likely. And notice, even in his greatest hour of need, Jesus was worried about the disciples. He was concerned for his disciples, making sure that they were okay rather than worried about himself. And look at verse 10. 
Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? See, at this time, Peter still thought he was ready to die with Jesus. He was ready to die for Jesus. He would make his stand right there. 600 soldiers and Jesus and a couple of guys. We don't know if Peter had just bad aim <laughs> or if he was, if the goal was to just maim the guy and hack off his ear. We don't, we don't know. I, I kind of assume he was a fisherman, probably not a, a great swordsman. But in his zeal, he had missed what was happening. In his zeal, he had missed what was happening. See, Jesus had to tell Peter, Peter, put your sword away. This is why I've come. This is why I'm here. I am here to save sinners. I, I love that, that Luke's gospel account tells us that Jesus actually picked up Malchus's bloody ear and put it back on his head. So again, I mean, just the, the control that Jesus is in over this whole scene. They, they're coming with their swords and their torches and their weapons, and there's this mass group of them, and, and, and he just knocks them flat on their butts, and then he allows them to pick themselves up, and, and then one of his own hacks off the ear, and he just picks it up and puts it back on. He doesn't say, yeah, take that, you know? It's an amazing scene. The last miraculous healing that's recorded that Jesus did was healing an enemy injured by one of his own. That's the last recorded miracle of Jesus, is he healed an enemy that was injured by one of his own. And I think we can learn from that. We need to learn to be careful that our zeal isn't misguided, resulting in hurt people. Jesus had come for sinners. He, he stepped forward because of his great love for sinners. That's why he was there. That's why he was allowing these things to take place, to happen to him, to experience the things he was about to experience, was for sinners, for people who were his enemies essentially, in that moment. And yet at times, if we're not careful, like Peter, we can sort of clumsily wield the sword of the word in a way that damages people. In a way that damages people in such a way that, that sometimes even pushes them away from the one, the very one, who died for them. From the one who came to love them. Because the word of God is powerful. And it is effective. It's effective. But we must let the spirit lead us in when and how we apply it and we use it. Amen. I, I would imagine if I said, uh, you know, took a show of hands, I won't. But, you know, if you've ever sort of felt beat up by the word of God, you know, if you've ever felt like someone used the word of God against you like a weapon, most of us would be able to say, yeah, kind of. Now, don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts you when the word of God goes out. That's not a beating. That's the Lord saying, hey, 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 something needs to change here. I want, to, I want you to come closer, right? So that's not getting beat up. But there are those times when someone is just kind of rashly or harshly or unlovingly using the truths of God's word to, to, sort, of, to sort of smack you around a little bit. We need to be careful. Because his word is truth, and we're not to be ashamed of it, but it can also be damaging. Especially when we're new believers. A lot of times when we're new believers, we can, we can just kind of be so excited about Jesus, and we want people to come to know Jesus so much, and we want them to experience what we're experiencing so much that sometimes we're a little pushy, right? Sometimes we can be a little, a little off-putting. We need to let the, the Spirit lead us in tact, right? To be tactful and to be... To be bold, yes, but to be loving in our application of, of our sword, the, the word of God. Let's cut down on the amount of people that Jesus has to heal 
as the result of his people, right? Let's cut down on that. Verse 12, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Don't you think some of the soldiers began to question whether what they were doing was good or not? They'd witnessed two miracles. So this, this lawbreaker, this man deserving of death that they were coming to arrest, they'd seen two miracles. First, when he, when he declared who he was, they were knocked flat on their backs. And then second, when he healed one of the enemy's ears, right? Surely some of them were thinking, I think we're on the wrong side. <laughs> Be that as it may, they arrested him anyway, and they took him before not the high priest, but before the high priest's father-in-law, Annas. Why the father-in-law? Well, because Annas was the high priest before, but he wasn't easy enough to control. So the Roman authorities had to sort of remove him, and they raised up his son-in-law, Caiaphas, in his place. But the people still really looked to Annas as their leader. They still really recognized Annas, and so they took Jesus before him. In verse 15, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, probably John. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the, the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So here we see the first of, of Peter's three denials of Jesus. You remember Jesus told Peter he would. He told Peter, and Peter's zeal, he said, oh, Lord, I'll, I'll die with you if I have to. And Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times tonight before the rooster crows. How could this happen to a devout Christ follower? How could Peter go from being willing to fight 600 Roman soldiers to die with Jesus to then denying him before a, a seemingly sort of insignificant individual, right? I mean, somebody that doesn't hold the position of power. They don't, they, this, this servant girl didn't, didn't have any sort of leverage to get at Peter with. How do you go from being willing to stand with Jesus and die for Jesus to being, to being able to deny that you really you even know him before someone that you don't even know? Well, we can't say for sure, but many Bible teachers have pointed out two warning signs that we'd all probably do well to note. The first is that Peter was still following Jesus, but at a distance. He had distanced himself from Jesus. That's pointed out in the passage. And the second is that, G is that Peter was warming himself at the enemy's fire. He, he was seeking sort of comfort and companionship almost with the enemy, with those who were re rejecting Jesus, those who, who did not believe that he was the Messiah. And here's the deal, following Jesus at a distance and seeking comfort among those who are not Christ followers will almost always result in disaster for us. It's just a recipe for disaster. If I know Jesus, if I love Jesus and I've given my life to Jesus and yet for whatever reason, I'm distancing myself from him. And not only am I distancing myself from him, but I'm, but I'm hanging out with the wrong people I'm going to wander as well. I'm going to find myself drifting and stumbling and going the wrong direction. Are you ever surprised at your own failure? At your own stumbling? Does it ever take you off guard? Something that you do or something, some way that you, you falter? 
I, I'm amazed at times how I can, I can spend some time in the morning in, in the scriptures and in prayer. And I can, I can be talking to the Lord and communing with the Lord. And I can head out the door thinking, oh, it's going to be a good day. And, and I'm just, man, I'm, I'm prayed up and I'm ready. And then later that afternoon, I can lose my temper with my kids. I can act insensitively toward my wife. I can blow it in some way. And I find myself just going, what happened? <laughs> how, did I, how did I get here? I started out so good. I was on the right track. And, and I just got off the rails. What happened? Well, for me, I know that it's, it's not just a one-time thing during the day, right? It's not just a one-time act in the, in the morning where I read my Bible and I pray and I close it and I say, okay, I'm, I'm set for the day. No, the scriptures tell us that we're to pray without ceasing, right? That we're to abide in Jesus. We're to stay connected to Jesus all throughout the day. All throughout the day. We're to, we're to take intentional steps toward that end. And, and now we have no excuse. We have, we have so, many, so many things at our disposal to enable us to do that even better, right? I mean, we have, we have our phones that, that have everything we could ever imagine on them as far as scripture reminders. And you can even set a reminder to go off throughout the day at increments or at different times that just say, pray. Or, or, even, or even a specific scripture pops up on the screen, or, or whatever the case is, right? It's important for us that we remain mindful of him throughout our day, that we're not wandering, we're not drifting from him. Uh, you may start great, but then you know, you, you feel it. The Holy Spirit tells you as the day goes on, hey, 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 you're wandering, you're wandering, come back. Come back, don't, don't, keep, don't keep going with that train of thought. Don't keep going with that, with that action. Come back to me. That's important. Amen. On another note of Peter's failure here, have you found that it's easier sometimes to stand strong in your faith in the face of an obvious attack than it is sometimes to stand strong in a more subtle, sort of benign temptation? I've felt that. I've noticed that. It's, like, it's almost like, you know, if, if someone to put a gun to your head and say, deny Jesus or die, I think a lot of us would say, I'm going to heaven. But it's in the day-to-day, -day, right? It's in the day-to-day -day temptations, the subtle temptations that sometimes that's where I get tripped up. You know, a co-worker is telling a, a dirty joke, and I don't, I don't stay, say anything about it, or I, or I step back. Now, that doesn't happen in my workplace, but it might happen in yours. Or, or maybe your uncle is, is telling, a, you know, is, is making racist comments or what, you know, whatever. Those subtle things that, that we, we just sort of allow, we, we don't, maybe even we, get, we enter into a little bit because we don't want that person to feel bad, right? I don't want to feel holier than thou or come off as holier than thou, and so I'll giggle a little bit in, in, to the bad joke or, or, or what, whatever the case is. Those are the times that we get tripped up maybe more often than the big obvious temptations, right? And again, that's why we need to abide, staying connected to our Lord at all times. Verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now this is amazing because they're, 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 they're saying that the reason they're arresting Jesus, the reason that they are, that, they, that, they are, that this man Jesus needs to be punished is because he's a lawbreaker. Right? He's breaking their law. He's breaking the Roman law. The problem here is, is this man is a lawbreaker who's causing all kinds of problems in the land. And yet everything they were doing was breaking their own laws. 
Everything they were doing was illegal according to their own laws. Their hatred of Jesus had caused them to just throw their laws out the window. And these are the guys that lived by the law. They lived by the law. Jesus even rebuked them for their, for their missing the whole point of the law and being so caught up in the minutia of it. See, Annas was no longer the, the authority. He didn't have the authority to hold this trial. He'd been removed. He wasn't the high priest anymore. Beyond that, it was illegal to hold a secret trial at night. It was illegal to strike an uncondemned prisoner. And it was illegal to condemn without witnesses. But in the face of it all, the Lord was in control. He was in control of the whole evening. All of the events that we're talking about, the Lord was in control of them all. The men thought that they were in control, but they weren't. They weren't. Don't you love Jesus' response to their silly interrogations? He says, I never taught in secret. You know what I taught. Ask those that heard me. Ask them what I taught. They'll, they'll tell you what I taught. Here's the thing. He, he knew it would make no difference. Jesus knew they'd made up their minds. He knew that they had already decided to, that he was guilty and that he, needed, he was deserving of death. Why? It wasn't about Jesus breaking the law. Why was it that they hated him so much? What was it about Jesus that they hated so much? What was it about this, this loving man who healed so many that they hated so much? It was because Jesus threatened their positions of power. Jesus was shaking things up. Jesus had an authority that they only dreamed of having. When Jesus spoke, the people listened. They hated the fact that he was taking, he was shaking up their system. He was changing their plans. He was, he was causing them to, to feel like, well, wait a minute. If the Messiah is truly here, well, then what happens to me? What happens to my power? I've, I've jockeyed for position. I've, I've finally gotten what, I, what I've always wanted, and now this man's here. I, I'm no longer needed. They had to get rid of him. It's easy for us to see how they were acting in selfish ambition, in sin. But if we're not careful, we also may seek to get rid of Jesus in our lives. If we're not careful, we can be guilty of some of the same things. Distancing ourselves from Jesus. Silencing his voice in our lives by, by not opening this book or by not coming to gather with the saints because I just don't really want to hear what it has to say. I just don't really want to hear God's voice right now. I want to do what I want to do. It's very similar to these guys. The Lord's changing my plans. I have, I have this five-year plan, this 10-year plan. I have goals for my retirement. I have... I have Goals for my life. I have ideals for my life. And he seems to be shaking those things up. And I'm not sure I want that. And so I love Jesus. I, I, I'm a Jesus follower. But I don't want to get too close. Because he kind of changes things. He messes with things. Right? He may be saying, hey, that relationship you're pursuing is not good for you. Hey, those friendships are not the friendships that you need. And, and you just kind of go, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it, Lord. Or, or maybe he's saying, hey, why don't, why don't you surrender your finances to me? And you say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that, Lord. It's not what I, that's not my plan. And we're tempted in those moments to get rid of Jesus. Maybe not fully. But we just want, we don't want to get too close because he's changing things. He's messing with things in our lives that we just don't really want him to touch. We just don't really want him to mess with. What do you do in those moments? Do we stick our fingers in our ears like little kids? La, 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 la. Can't hear you, Lord. Sorry. Bad connection. Or do we heed him? See, there's no neutral ground with Jesus. Right? He's either Lord on the throne or he's deserving of death. He's a lunatic. There's no neutral ground with Jesus. 
And so which is it? Is he my Lord on the throne of my life that I'm surrendered to? He's my master? Or is he somebody that I just, I don't, I don't want too close? Is he somebody I'd like to silence his voice? Well, at this point in the evening, not only did they illegally strike Jesus, but we know from the other Gospels that the, the brutal beatings had already begun. The brutal beatings had already begun. It was in the courtyard of the high priest that Jesus was blindfolded by the, the, the Roman troops, and they would strike him in the face blindfolded, causing all sorts of damage to him. And they would mock him while doing so, saying, prophesy, who struck you? Prophesy, who is it that's hitting you? And while Jesus endured the pain, Peter was confronted again. Look at verse 25. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? And then Peter denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. When Peter was confronted again, he again denied his association with Jesus. And Matthew's gospel tells us that the third time he swore. He swore and he said, I do not know the man. As he's warming himself at the enemy's fire. And immediately the rooster crowed. And immediately Peter remembered what Jesus had said. And Luke's gospel tells us he ran out of the courtyard and he wept bitterly. Amazing. Again, we find ourselves sort of asking, how could Peter do this? How could Peter do such a thing? And again, we need to ask ourselves, are we guilty of the same? We may not outright deny Jesus, but do our actions at times deny that we know him? Do the, do the ways that we handle ourselves in certain situations, hot, hot situations or, or, or uh, difficult situations, do they deny that we know Jesus? If we're not careful, that may be the case. And the question in the face of those failures is, when we're convic convicted, how do we handle it? How do we handle it? Do we just say, oh, I'm never going to get it right and just sort of resign ourselves to sin? Or do we sort of justify ourselves before the Lord? Or do we hide and, and sort of like Adam and Eve, we hide and we, we cover ourselves and we, and we sort of feel like maybe after a few days I'll, I'll, I'll be sufficiently punished and then I can kind of come back to the presence of God? How do we handle it when we find that we've, we've let the Lord down, we've sinned, we've, we've faltered, we've failed? What do we do in those moments? Do we say, well... I'm just going to live with no regrets. I'm just going to keep on going. Or do we say, well, the Lord will forgive me. I'll just continue on. I hope not. I hope that we in those moments say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, God, forgive me. You know that I'm, I'm frail. You know that I'm fickle. You know that I'm weak. You know that I struggle. And turn to him. 1 John 1.19 or, I'm sorry, one nine promises, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you find yourself this morning just kind of going, you know what, I identify with Peter a whole lot more than I wish I did, then today's the day to say, Lord, I confess. Forgive me, God, for the times that I've pushed you away, I've distanced myself, for the times that I've sought to silence your voice. Forgive me, Lord, for the times I didn't stand up for my faith. Forgive me for the times that I, I erupted, I blew up. Forgive me, Lord. Strengthen me, God. Help me to move forward in faith. We must humble ourselves. 
I, I love Acts 3.19, one of my favorite verses about repentance. It says, repent that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The verse says more than that. It's aimed at unbelievers. But for us, repent. And as we repent, as we just say, oh, Lord, I confess, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Here's the deal. Lastly, he's not surprised by my failures. I am at times. He's not surprised by your sin. He knew what you would do all along. He knew how you would fail. He knew how you would falter. And that's exactly why he came and did what he did. That's exactly why he endured what he endured, because he knows you, and he knows me, and he understands mankind. So don't allow the, the enemy to convince you that you can't run to the Lord when you blow it. The Lord is waiting with open arms every time. He's saying, oh, son, oh, daughter, just come back. Just come back. Yeah, you, you tripped. Yeah, you, you skinned your knee. Yeah, you got beat up. Yeah, I had to put that guy's ear back on his head. <laughs> but you can come back. Just come back. Isn't that amazing? Don't waste another minute feeling sorry for yourself when you fall. We're sheep. He knows that. And he knows we need a good shepherd. And our good shepherd died for us. And so let's run back into his loving arms that are always open for us. When we are failing, when we are faltering, he is strong every time. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the way that you love us. God, we confess this morning that we, we, we are weaker than we wish we were. Lord, we falter, we, we fail more often than we wish we did. Lord, we, we're even shocked at our own failures at times. Jesus, draw us close. Draw us close to you. Hold us tight to you. Lord, when we're, when we're tempted to push you away, when we're tempted to silence your voice, God, help us. We thank you, Jesus, that you didn't falter, you didn't pull back, you didn't fail in any way. In the work that was set before you, you drank the cup. You stepped forward because of your great love for us. Thank you, Jesus. And we love you because you first loved us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand. Let's sing one last song to our Lord. Men of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of men and wrath of God has been on Jesus lay silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned bowing to Please.
Father, we thank you. Lord, we pray that you would give us the boldness and the courage to go forward in this, in the work that you've given to us, Lord, not only in life and death, but in the every single day. God, we ask this in your name and in your power. Amen. Guys, have a wonderful week. We'll see you back next week.